going to talk to you about malaria vaccines that are being developed and tested in Seattle, but also malaria vaccines that are being developed and tested around the world. Before we start, I'd just like to point out this is uh, me off of Ballard last week. Um, <laughs> so this is one way to view the pipeline. But we'll sort of see that there's a lot of things in the pipeline, but not a whole lot yet that has come out the end as a marketed product. Um, hopefully that will increase. So today we're going to talk about malaria infection. We'll touch on um, aspects of the immune response. Um, and we'll focus specifically on the stage of the infection known as the pre-erythrocytic stage. So the stage that comes out of the mosquito and is in the liver before it goes on to the disease-causing stage in red cells. In order to test many of this, these vaccines, we use a system called the Controlled Human Malaria Infection Model. Um, and we are one of few centers worldwide here in Seattle that does this, so I'll tell you about that. And then I'll tell you about some candidates in the, in the pipeline and, and have some closing thoughts about where the field is going. So the only disclaimer is that um, we receive some travel and research support from Abbott for diagnostic tests that we do in support of malaria vaccines. And the objectives of the talk are really um, as follows. So to identify a couple parts of the life cycle that we would consider to be bottlenecks and why it might be a good idea to target a bottleneck, to understand what the Malaria Clinical Trial Center at Seattle Biomed is doing, um, and to name the leading subunit vaccine candidate, why it works, and to also sort of describe why whole organism vaccines might be good, but why it might be challenging to make and deliver those vaccines. So some of you might remember this slide from five years ago when I gave um, grand rounds. And at that time, I talked about why the malaria parasite was so good at evading the immune response. Today, we're not going to focus on that as much. We're going to focus on sort of real demonstrable progress that has been made towards making vaccines that will really be used in people. So what is malaria? Malaria is a single-celled eukaryotic um, organism of the genus Plasmodium. Um, as P depicted by Dr. Seuss here, it is transmitted by female um, anopheline mosquitoes when they take a blood meal. And it at first infects your liver asymptomatically, and later it infects your red cells as pictured here. And it's the red cell stage that's um, the cause of all clinical disease. <coughs> so the toll of malaria worldwide cannot be underestimated. Um, there's probably over 200 million cases a year, and of this maybe at least 660,000, and some people, um, even at this institution, would suggest that number is somewhere over a million, over a million deaths due to malaria every year, which means that 75 or maybe more than 100 people will die from malaria during this lecture. Um, the burden of malaria is really disproportionately leveled on the poorest countries in the world, and most of these countries are in Africa. And so what's really exciting over the last 20 years is there's a real concerted effort underway, not just to drive down the causes of malaria, but to actually eradicate that. And much of this effort has been, um, ha has been fostered by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So the best way um, to look at the life cycle is through this video, I think, which some of you may have seen before. It comes from Steve Swank, who's a physician and a medical illustrator. So this is a female anopheline mosquito who's following a carbon dioxide plume to a person. Um, and then she's going to take a blood meal, because that's required for her, um, for her offspring. And so um, while she takes the blood meal, these modal sporozoites, um, which are depicted here as these little purple, purple guys, they um, are injected into the skin. They find their way to the liver. And eventually, they take up residence in a hepatocyte. And one sporozoite can give rise to 30,000 daughter merozoites. The merozoites bud from the hepatocytes some days later in these little packets called merosomes. And then in the bloodstream, the merosomes lyse. This probably happens in the lung. And um, then the merozoites that emerge have this complex apical tip, um, which allows them to invaginate and invade red blood cells. And in red blood cells, over one or two or three days, depending on the species, they live inside a little membranous sac where they undergo um, growth and division themselves. And it's now that you actually can find out that you have malaria. So it may begin as fevers and chills, as flu-like symptoms. Because of the cyclical destruction of red cells, you can get anemia. You can have vomiting. But you can also have very debilitating and even deadly um, symptoms uh, and diseases, so cerebral malaria, et cetera. At the late, st late part of the red cell stage, Plasmodium falciparum is able to actually adhere to the blood vessel wall and thereby escape filtering by the spleen. 
and eventually these all lice and they release more merozoites. You get to a point when there's enough parasites around that a switch is thrown and gametocyte stage parasites, which are a sexual stage parasite, are also produced. So gametocytes are male and female parasites that don't do anything in humans. But if a mosquito comes along, then they can be taken up in the next blood meal. And then this can continue to propagate the cycle in the mosquito. So the male gametocyte fertilizes the female, and this forms a zygote. The zygote insists in the midgut cell wall. And depending on the temperature, um, this takes a week or two for sporozoites to form in the, in the resulting ookinete. So the closer you are to the equator, the faster this occurs, the further away you are, the slower. Eventually, the oocyst ruptures, and it releases sporozoites that make their way back to the salivary gland. And these can be propagated to another person in the event that the mosquito goes on to take another blood meal. So this is the cycle that we would like to interrupt using bed nets, vaccines, drugs, infrastructure, et cetera. Because really what this cycle is, is a ticking time bomb for every person who's infected. And it's a race against the clock, as shown here, to form these different kind of immune responses um, that will allow you to make antibodies that can block sporozoites, to make um, CD8 T cells that could, for instance, kill hepat infected hepatocytes, to make uh, antibodies that can prevent the cyclical infection of red cells. And some people think that we could even make vaccines um, over here on the right called transmission blocking vaccines, where we would induce an antibody response in a person against targets that don't exist in you, but that exist when the, after the parasite goes on into the mosquito. And so transmission blocking vaccines are intended to use our own antibodies to uncouple the life cycle after it leaves your body and goes on into the mosquito. So today we're really going to focus on this part of the life cycle up here. Um, and the reason for this will become clear in a moment. But we're talking about antibodies to block sporozoites and CD8 T cells um, to eradicate infected hepatocytes should the sporozoites make it that far. So, I think every microbiologist has at some point quoted um, the art of war. And uh, this is the first time I've done this. So, um, but I think this quote is really appropriate for why we would choose our vaccine targets where we do. So um, Sun Tzu said, so in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and strike at what is weak. And if you look at the number of parasites that exist in a person at any given time point, there's really some so-called bottlenecks here um, that make really attractive vaccine targets. So when the mosquito um, bites you, you might receive 10 or 100 sporozoites. These might infect um, 5 or 50 hepatocytes. And so this is a relatively small number of infected cells. But as I said, each sporozoite can make 30,000 daughter cells. So if you wait long enough, you really are starting to see an increase in the number of parasites um, in that late stage. But it's nothing compared to what happens when the parasites emerge from the liver and go into the red cells. Red cells are packed at billions of red cells per mil, and we can achieve parasitemia as in excess of 1%, which means you can have billions um, and billions of parasites in a highly infected person. And so when we think of vaccines against the red cell stage, these are really intended to mitigate disease. But when we think about vaccines against the bottlenecks, and, and so when we transmit back to the mosquito, this also represents a bottleneck. When we think about vaccines against these um, areas, it's because one of the reasons is that there's relatively few parasites, and that this is an attractive target. So we're going to focus on the sporozoid and liver stage for the rest of the talk. And the first question is, is this even possible? And um, so one of my students, Zach Billman, is here. And we were at a meeting um, last week. And malaria vaccine uh, makers have known about this data, which I'll show you for a long while. So first I'll show you this, and then I'll sort of tell you what Zach was thinking. So in 1967, Ruth Nussensweig um, was at NYU, um, and she went on to pursue this work um, with her husband, Victor Nussensweig, as well. And what they did was they were working on a mouse model of malaria, where the mice were infected with a rodent parasite called Plasmodium burgii. They found is if you dissected the salivary glands of these mosquitoes and you gave them to mice, if you gave them 10,000 of these sporozoites, you killed the mouse outright. So they did what everybody else was doing in the 60s, which is if you were going to make a vaccine, you got your material, you made a lysate, or you killed it, or you, you cooked it with some heat. But that, didn't, that wasn't a vaccine for malaria, because those mice died when they were challenged as well. The real breakthrough, and we'll see, maybe the nuisance fags will get that, 
Nobel Prize for this or something one day, was that they found that if you attenuated the parasites, some but not enough to kill them, they would, when you then injected them, they would still be alive, they would go into the liver, they would undergo some limited replication, but they wouldn't go on to a red cell stage. And when you challenge these mice with wild type parasites, they were protected from challenge. So this kind of immunity is not observed in the field um, because the number of parasites that are given experimentally is much higher than in the field. And yet this has been taken forward into human trials, and this was first shown in the 1970s that it, Amongst people who've received 1,000 irradiated sporozoids or more, they've been at least 93% protected um, based on sort of a summary of all the literature. And the reason that uh, both animals and people appear to be protected in these studies really hinges on the induction of CD8 T cells um, that can search out and kill the infected hepatocytes. So what Zach was asking at this meeting was, this was 1967, and now this is 2013, so why did this take so long? Well, the reality is that we started to study the sporozoite and figure out, out of this whole complicated organism, what are the discrete um, antigens that are being targeted. And at the time, there was great hope that we would be able to recombinantly express individual antigens and that immunity to these individual antigens would confer protection. And so we have some limited success in that realm. but. The reality is that none of those approaches to date, and I'll show you as we go along, none of those approaches have been able to achieve sterilizing immunity the way that sporozoites have. And so in the last 10 years, we've come back to this sporozoite model and to the human challenge model as a way to really move things forward. So in essence, it's sort of a back to the beginnings um, in some ways. So since the nuisance fags discovery, people have focused on what makes the sporozoites work so well. And one of the first things that was discovered was that this thing is covered in a protein um, aptly called circumsporozoite protein. In fact, it also lays down a little trail, as you can see with these little drops behind it, as it makes its way from the skin to the liver. And so it's a target in the liver, and it's also a target on the way to the liver for the immune system. We know that any malaria vaccine that will be the final product will have to contain CSP. This is an immunodominant antigen. And most vaccine makers have focused on CSP, but we now know that CSP alone may not be sufficient to kind of achieve the sterilizing immunity that at least people who want to eradicate malaria would desire. Nonetheless, what we know about CSP and how it's being developed as a standalone vaccine may still have a great deal of impact on malaria. So we'll talk um, for a few minutes about how malaria vaccines are developed and tested. And so malaria vaccines, like drugs and vaccines for anything else, go through a series of preclinical and clinical trial testing. And I just point out a few sort of salient features uh, that are particular to malaria here. So we, of course, do in vitro studies and animal studies, including studies in non-human primates. Um, and if that data looks good, the the vaccine candidate, for instance, will move forward into human clinical trials, starting with safety and immunogenicity trials, which are phase one trials, involving relatively few people um, and taking uh, not, not very long. And often these trials um, will begin in non-endemic regions and eventually perhaps move to endemic regions. Um, phase one B trials and phase two trials are intended to begin to assess the efficacy of a vaccine. So traditionally, the way vaccines have um, been tested is that most vaccine makers don't have a challenge model. We don't have a challenge model for HIV. We put an HIV vaccine out into the field and we try to look and see how many people acquired HIV in whatever setting it was compared to people who weren't vaccinated. But one of the fortunate things about malaria is that we have a human challenge model and it's very safe and I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. So phase two studies often begin with a um, phase 2A study here in the United States or Europe where we test the efficacy of these early candidates in a human challenge setting. Um, and that allows us to be more confident when we put them out into the field or particularly when we go to phase three studies, which are the critical crux for vaccines or really any um, potential product to see if it can go forth to regulators. And then it, after something is approved, you know, these are, they continue to be monitored, particularly for ongoing efficacy, ongoing safety, and to find rare serious adverse events that we just might not find by testing um, 10 or 20,000 people. You know, certain adverse events with vaccines only manifest once. A half a million or a million people have been vaccinated. 
So all told, this could take more than a decade, cost more than half a billion dollars, involve up to 100,000 people, but for something like malaria, hopefully um, at the end of this, we have a life-saving product. These are all the places that um, WHO is aware of clinical trials for malaria going on in the world. And where there are stars are all the centers that are conducting um, controlled human malaria infection trials. So what is this CHMI um, system? So as I've sort of already alluded to, these are phase one and two studies of vaccines. We're also doing two studies here in Seattle of a um, potential prophylactic drug, so it doesn't apply just to um, vaccines. And the idea is that this is a very good filter for um, it to basically do a con really controlled trial um, in malaria naive individuals to see if the vaccine candidate of interest should go forth into further phase two field and phase three studies. So what happens is the, the subjects are enrolled. Um, some of them who are in the vaccination or drug treatment arm get vaccinated however many times. One of the vaccines that's out there has five doses. Um, so there's often a, quite a lead up to the infectious challenge stage. So once you have um, someone who has the right amount of drug on board or has been vaccinated the requisite number of times, they come into our um, center where they are uh, challenged with the bites of uh, mosquitoes that are carrying wild type malaria, or in some cases they're challenged with um, intravenous malaria parasites. This model has a really excellent safety record. You know, people always w wonder um, when they hear this because they really don't know about its excellent safety record, but there was a nice review done that summarized um, studies from 1986 to 2002 um, that had 532 subjects in them, mostly at the Army and the Navy, and there was uh, really an excellent safety track record, and many hundreds of people have been immunized um, in these systems since then. So in Seattle, um, we do this at Seattle Biomedical Research Institute, where the mission is to test the safety and efficacy of these in um, early studies. Critical to this effort is uh, a facility that exists at Seattle Biomed that's very rare anywhere else in the world. And this is the Center for Mosquito Production and Malaria Infection Research. So this is an insectary, and I made a video of the insectary, which I'll show you in a second. Um, this insectary rears both um, mosquitoes that are infected with ma malaria for animal models, and it also, in a separate um, good manufacturing practice grade insectary, rears mosquitoes infected with Plasmodium falciparum for our human challenge studies. It has the ability to actually um, put forward two separate clinical grade sets of mosquitoes at once so that we can conduct two trials in parallel. So we've done a number of trials um, since the center opened in 2008. We did a demonstration trial showing that we could successfully infect subjects. We did a very long and complicated um, trial known as IVT where subjects were immunized actually using wild type um, malaria parasites but at the same time they were treated with chloroquine so that when the parasites came out of the liver they were killed immediately. This is thought to induce very strong and broad immune responses um, and then these people went forward to challenge and some of them were sterilely protected um, from infectious challenge. We've also done a, a couple other trials and our upcoming trials include testing of the PFSPZ vaccine which I'll talk about in great depth <coughs> and likely other whole sporozoid vaccines. And then we're also testing a new candidate prophylactic um, drug called DSM-265, and we'll have two studies of that in the next year. This um, center is really a, a partnership of many um, groups in partnership with Seattle Biomed, and it's relied on a whole number of people, um, some of whom are pictured here and here um, on this slide. So one of the things that's unique about many of these human challenge trials is that, um, of course, there's a lab part, there's an insectary part, but um, up until recently, we also had a hotel phase to these trials. So uh, about six or seven days after the subjects were um, expected to become parasitemic, if they were not protected, they all, we all went to the hotel and uh, took up residence there for the window of about a week when they were likely to become parasitemic. So we uh, transformed the hotel rooms. You can see here I'm putting down plastic on the floor. We've turned a, a hotel bathroom into a laboratory um, in order to stain smears for uh, make gene sustains for malaria parasites. And, um, and then here we are st staying up at night in case somebody uh, comes down with malaria and needs to have a blood smear in the middle of the night. The larvae undergo three molts and eventually form pupae here. These pupae are actually in, a, um, in an enclosed container with a net over the top because uh, eventually the mosquitoes climb out of the pupae, dry off for a few minutes and fly out. And so then they're um, enc encased in these nets here. And can we have the sound? <laughs> 
Um, so here, this is supposed to be a day in the life of a mosquito. This is obviously in fast forward. Um, but eventually, you find yourself in, a, uh, in an incubator. And this is actually what you look at most of the day. You don't get carted around. You might be lucky enough as a mosquito to actually participate in one of our trials and not just be sort of run-of-the-mill mosquito. It's just to prove we're in Seattle. Um, and uh, so you get, you get taken from the human insectary, uh, if you're one of these mosquitoes, and you, you go through this little container here, which is a one-way window from the insectary into the human challenge room. And uh, you know, you get a little nervous, time stands still here, but eventually you get pulled back out, and uh, you get lined up for your, your volunteer, um, who's been consented to be bitten by you. And uh, so eventually, you know, as a mosquito, you really know what to do. You see this, you get a, we put a towel over the arm, and uh, the mosquito gets to, to bite and take its blood meal. And so uh, this is a very effective way to test um, human malaria vaccines. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that we're doing here. So this is a more simplified version of that. <laughs> these mosquitoes are um, fed on gametocytes. They then take up these gametocytes in over two weeks. They form sporozoites, as you've already learned. And then our volunteers come in, they're challenged, they undergo an asymptomatic liver stage infection. Hopefully our vaccines work here and so nothing further happens. But there's always a control arm and so there's always some subjects who go on to develop blood stage um, infections. We're actually in the process of doing away with the hotel phase because of the great work that um, the Department of Lab Medicine has done for these trials. We've been able to develop and implement um, molecular diagnostics in support of these trials. And we've actually partnered with a whole bunch of groups at other centers around the world um, as well. The advantage of molecular diagnostics over blood smears is that we have a three or four day lead time where we can tell that someone is, uh, has parasites in the blood before the blood smears become positive. This is before they're symptomatic. So we can, um, in trials going forward, we are going to actually eliminate the hotel phase, save several hundreds of thousands of dollars per, ta or per trial, um, and use the RT-PCR data that's um, that's done by the people listed here um, to, to help with that. So this is a real great thing that our department is doing in support of these trials. And we think the role for this will be expanded, not just for um, trials, but also for epidemiologic surveillance as eradication goes forward. So there are many vaccines in the global malaria vaccine pipeline. Um, the ones in purple are supposed to target sporozoites or the liver stage. Those in blue target the blood stage. And there's one so-called transmission blocking vaccine um, in the pipeline. So the human challenge model is really important, especially for these liver stage vaccines, because this is just too many candidates to have out there in the field at, at any one time. There's a lot of different targets. And the reality is that out of all these targets, most of them have been unsuccessful in field trials to date. Most vaccines that consist of one or two antigens, at least as they've been formulated and tested to date, have had almost no efficacy. The only things that have been efficacious, and I don't expect you to be able to read the text, are the two things at the top, which are whole sporozoites and CSP. These are really head and shoulders above everything else. And so the question is, can we make these vaccines into something that can save lives? And can we also use these vaccines um, as something to tell us how to make maybe the second or third generation of malaria vaccine, the one that will really sort of go forward and, and really change things? And the problem with immunology and vaccinology and this whole field is that there is so many questions to be had. What are the best antigens? There's 5,200 genes in the Plasmodium falciparum genome. So how do you pick a handful? Maybe you need to pick 50. Maybe you need to pick 500. When you throw the whole organism in there, you pick, you pick the whole thing. But the parasite has co-evolved with people for tens of thousands of years. And so um, it's not clear that the immunity induced by sporozoites um, is the best that it could be. Maybe we could do better. There's a lot of other questions. Adjuvants, routes, schedule, do we need a booster? How long is this going to last? Is it going to do anything to other vaccines that are in the expanded program on immunization? Um, because we certainly don't want to um, have those vaccines for which we already have good um, coverage um, take a hit because we're deploying a new vaccine. All these things need to be tested. Um, and we have to get to the vaccine that we want to test first. So broadly speaking, I would divide malaria vaccines into two groups. There is the whole organism, and there is anything less than the whole organism, which we'll call a subunit vaccine. Most subunits today have consisted of, as it sounds like, just one or two things. But 
Um, and so subunit vaccines can again be split up. Um, and the one we're going to talk about today basically consists of protein coupled with adjuvant. The adjuvant is there to stimulate the immune response and say, hey, pay attention to this thing I just injected. There are other subunit vaccines that potentially could carry many, many more pro proteins or genes than just one or two. And so DNA vaccines have been heralded for many years as the answer to this. The US Navy did a lot of work 10 or 15 years ago along these lines. Um, and it was deemed that DNA vaccines weren't going to go anywhere. But a company named Inovio has sort of resurrected this for HIV. And they have a malaria project as well. And so it's hoped that um, perhaps things like delivery and, and how it's formulated will allow DNA vaccines to be resurrected. Um, the University of Oxford has a viral vectored vaccine platform, which is quite good. And then there's a number of um, different groups who are making sporozoic vaccines, and we'll talk about two of them. So first, we'll talk about um, a subunit vaccine made by GlaxoSmithKline. And this is called Moscarix. And the generic name for this is RTSS. So this vaccine focuses on the circumsporozoid protein, which is no surprise, given what I've told you. But this is coupled to the hepatitis B surface antigen. The premise for this vaccine is that the CSP, by, by introducing CSP as a protein with adjuvant, you will make antibodies and you will make CD4 T cell responses that will, for the most part, um, function to block invasion of sporozoites into the liver cells. We know that anti-CSP responses, if they induce CD8 T cells, can also kill infected liver cells. But this vaccine does not seem particularly good at inducing CD8 T cells. So this vaccine has had several lives. It was first formulated in an adjuvant called ASO2A. And it has been reformulated into another adjuvant. And this is the vaccine that's being carried forward. It's given three times um, intramuscularly at one month injection. So in this way, it perfectly fits with the expanded program on immunization. It's um, stable in the fridge for three years. You have to use it um, within six hours. I think when I show you the efficacy data over the next few slides, some of you are going to say, oh, it's not very efficacious. Keep in mind that the data on this vaccine suggests that it is able to debulk um, the incoming amount of parasites 95%. So it can take 95% of what the mosquito puts in, and it can reduce that down so that only 5% comes through. The problem is that if that's one or more parasites going through the red cell stage, you're off to the races, and now you have red cell infection. So in many settings, 95% would be great. But in malaria, for eradication, 95% doesn't cut it. 95% after four years, we'll eventually see, leads to a, a calculated efficacy of 16%. So it's a big difference. Nonetheless, this um, project is five or 10 years ahead of any other project. And um, it's likely to be submitted to European regulators in 2014, once the remainder of the 32-month um, phase three data is in. I think one of the interesting things about this is that GlaxoSmithKline has agreed to basically make no profits on this vaccine. They um, intend to put the vaccine out there with a 5% markup. And this has um, been agreed on that this would be returned to research and development on tropical diseases. So. Um, you know, they have to have assurances that someone will purchase the vaccine, but um, they're intending to make very little profit on this for a pharmaceutical company. So what is this antigen? Um, the antigen consists of a fusion protein of hep B surface antigen and part of the CSP protein fused together. That's the RTSS piece. Um, one of these RTSSs is coupled with three parts of the S alone, and the S alone is simply the hep B surface um, antigen. When you make this in yeast, they spontaneously assemble into these, into these polymers. And then the vaccine is formulated with this um, liposome-based adjuvant um, that includes MPL and saponin, that are two adjuvants that are licensed for use in humans. So as I said before, the rationale here is to make neutralizing antibodies and perhaps make CD4 T cells um, to help kill infected, uh, in infected cells. This is this. If you ever get a chance to look at this up close, it's very interesting. But this sort of basically is an effort by someone to depict the very convoluted path that took us from the nuisance fikes discovery in 1967 to where we are today, getting closer and closer to having the first ever human malaria vaccine. The thing I'd like to point out is that a lot of money has been spent on this project. The Gates Foundation has committed $635 million. GlaxoSmithKline has spent over $300 million since 1987, and they think that their phase three study alone will cost $100 million. So these are really big numbers for a, 
for a disease that for the most part affects the developing world. So I'm very proud of these um, funders and these groups that they've sort of stuck with it for all this time. And the US Army as well. You know, we have, a, we have a stake in protecting our troops against malaria, but the ramifications of having a malaria vaccine go way beyond just the US Army, so it's great. If you look at this investment, the return on it could be really tremendous. People um, have done different analyses to look at how much money is lost to malaria. Some put the number at $12 billion a year. Um, a recent study that just came out tried to look at how much um, money would be saved between now and 2035, and they put the number at $208 billion if we um, continue to eradicate malaria. This more than outweighs the costs of the eradication campaigns. So this is just a um, busy slide, which I'm not going to um, go into any depth on, showing that RTSS has undergone many phase one and two studies, both um, in uh, endemic and non-endemic regions. And one of the things that's been noticed is that um, they can monitor the immune response to both the hep B surface antigen here in B and to the CSP protein here in A. And um, some of these kids had pre-existing immunity to hep B surface antigen, and the hepatitis B vaccine is part of the EPI program. So that's why the control group um, shows immune responses to hep B surface um, antigen. But what you'll notice is that over this 20-month um, period in this phase two study, people made and maintained very nice hep B surface um, antigen immune responses, whereas the response to CSP could be brought on by the three doses of immunization, but it waned over that 20, same 20-month period. And this will make sense to you when you see the efficacy data. So there's three papers that have reported phase three um, study data on the RTSS vaccine, the first of which came out in 2011. This reported um, the data from months zero to 12 in two groups of children, both little kids who were five to 17 months old and infants six to 12 weeks old. And what they found was that if you looked at this um, through the lens of clinical cases, so that is fever and a demonstrated amount of parasites on slides, they found that the vaccine within a year of giving it reduced the amount of malaria cases by 56%, which is really tremendous because in some places, Malaria is the main thing that people are dealing with, and most of the people who come very sick through the door have malaria. There was a reduction in severe cases, and it was noticed that it didn't work as well in the little kids as it worked in, the, as it, it didn't work as well in the infants as it worked in the slightly older kids. And this is just a plot showing how that difference between the vaccinated group and the control group, um, you know, how big that difference was over the, the length of the study. So the people in the control group either got meningococcus vaccine or a rabies vaccine, depending on their age group. In 2012, um, data from the 18-month time point came out. And here, um, this was expanded to include all 15,000 children who were involved in the study, now from just seven centers up to 11 centers reporting. And what they found was, not surprisingly, that the efficacy at a year and a half was lower than the efficacy at 12 months. So um, whereas we were at 56% before, the reduction in cases had now dropped to 46%. The reduction in severe cases had dropped a little. Um, in some cases, the data on the, the six to 12 week olds was no longer statistically different than the control group. Nonetheless, they still point out that if you vaccinated 1,000 kids, you would have averted 941 cases over that time period in, your, in that region because many kids have recurrent cases of malaria, you know, and more than once within this reporting period. Just earlier this year, the four-year efficacy data on this vaccine came out, and it continued to show declining efficacy um, and, you know, a declining number of cases averted over this, this four-year period. So when they look at the data, all told, over four years, um, they decided that the efficacy was really only 16.8% over that four years that someone would be protected over that whole period. And this is really in stark contrast to most of the vaccines in the EPI program. So most vaccines have a 90% disease aversion rate. So here we're talking about 16% or maybe a little bit higher depending on your time window compared to 90%. But we're also talking about 220 million infections a year and so even some modest um, efficacy may, may prove to be important. There's a few things we can point out from this vaccine. One is that the eff effectiveness wanes over time. And they knew this from the pooled um, phase two data. If they looked right after vaccination, 
efficacy in this one study was 36%. If they looked after three years, it was really, there was really no longer any protection afforded by the vaccine. And the phase three data basically recapitulated that. There's going to be additional data coming out next year that's going to include what happens when you give a booster, and that's hopeful um, that this will improve. It's also notable that the vaccine worked differently in different parts of Africa. So not all of Africa is, um, in Africa there are basically different transmission intensities when it comes to malaria. And what was noted um, both in phase two and phase three data is that the vaccine worked better in low intensity um, malaria transmission regions. And in high transmission regions, the efficacy approached 0%. So you can see that in the phase three data. In a low or average exposure area, they got more efficacy at the beginning and it lasted longer as compared to in the high exposure regions where the efficacy was lower to begin with and went away quicker. So what's ahead for this vaccine? You know, they were never, they've never been able to show that there's an effect of this vaccine on mortality. And that may be because they really, even with thousands of subjects enrolled, we really need tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands to see an effect on mortality. There's some modeling data that suggests that if we employ this vaccine alongside the expanded program on immunizations, we could maybe expect to see six to 11 lives saved per thousand kids vaccinated. There also is a bunch of stuff um, going forward to look at the cost effectiveness of this vaccine, to look at how it will be used in special populations such as people with HIV and pregnant women. And so it's clear that, well, RTSS will not achieve eradication on its own. It is not the magic bullet to um, drive malaria out. But it can be used in concert with bed nets and drugs and expanded um, surveillance as another tool to help control and drive down um, malaria. So there are lots of other subunit vaccines that are in development. And just like RTSS, many of these consist of just one or two or up to five um, antigens out of 5,200 proteins. So we won't talk about these anymore, but there's a lot of other sort of parallel pathways. So instead, we'll move from subunit vaccines now to sporozoite vaccines. And so instead of talking about just a handful of antigens, we're talking about the whole thing, the stoichiometry of which we really don't know. But we know from what I showed you earlier that whole sporozoites can achieve sterilizing immunity. And this will be highly desirable um, for eradication efforts. So there's, just like subunit vaccines, there's many flavors of whole sporozoite vaccines. You, can you have to attenuate them or treat them with drugs. So you can attenuate them with radiation or you can genetically manipulate them so they are unable to progress through the liver stage. This is the only kind of vaccine that's been able to induce sterilizing immunity. And schematically, the kinds of flavors of sporozoites are as follows. Irradiated sporozoites will go into the liver but they won't grow up to be a full, fully grown infected liver cell. They arrest, we call them early. And you also can make genetically attenuated versions that will arrest around the same time. If you delete a different gene, as Stefan Kopp is doing here at Seattle Biomed, you can make them arrest later. The idea with them arresting later is that maybe they'll express some antigens that will broaden the immune repertoire and lead, make them more effective. And the third option is to just not attenuate them at all, to let them sail on through the liver, but to give people chloroquine at the same time or another drug so that when they come out the other end, they're killed immediately thereby inducing the broadest um, immune repertoire possible. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of hurdles to making a vaccine like this work. There is no in vitro culture system for sporozoites, otherwise we wouldn't really have the next few slides. The only way we can make these sporozoites is to have an insectary like the one I showed you. And so it was a major manufacturing achievement for this company, Scenaria, which is headed up by Steve Hoffman, um, who used to run the Navy's malaria research program to make and manufacture um, sporozoites that, fed the, that met the following criteria. They were aseptic, they're grown in a clean room, they're radiation attenuated, they're still alive, they're metabolically active, they're purified away from the mosquito junk, they're cryopreserved um, so that when they are thawed, they'll still be alive and that they're, they can be injected and that they meet all FDA criteria. So this was reported in 2010. And many people said this wasn't possible, but um, if you've ever met Steve Hoffman, um, it, anything is possible. The second hurdle that sporozoite vaccine makers um, faced was how to get these into people. So of course, the first thing they did was took the route that everybody else takes, intradermal or subcutaneous, and they found that in their study, um, this vaccine, which is known as PFSPZ, 
only two of 16 people were protected. So Bob Cedar at the NIH repeated this study in non-human primates and gave the vaccine either by um, subcutaneous route or intravenously. And what he found was that the only wet time you got the kind of immune responses that we expected is when you gave the vaccine intravenously. So Scenaria, um, in partnership with many other people, went on to test the PFSPZ vaccine by um, five intravenous doses. And what they found is in the low dose groups, there was really no protection. But really the landmark finding was that in the, in the six subjects who got 135,000 sporozoites injected intravenously five times, all of them were protected from challenge, and six of the nine people who got four doses of that were also protected from challenge. This dose is thought to be approximately what happens when you get 1,000 sporozoites by mosquito bite. And so it made sense to them that this dose was about right. So they're taking this forward, and we're going to be testing this vaccine here in a multi-centered trial um, that also includes the NIH and the University of Maryland. So the next hurdle for this vaccine is how are you going to get it into people? Um, and so intravenous delivery has never really been attempted for any vaccines. And, um, and yet, Scenaria seems to um, be intent on making this possible. And one of the ways that they're doing this, they have to deliver one mil of this sporozoid vaccine through a 25 gauge needle, and they have to do it uh, up to five times, is to use this um, infrared imaging device called the vein viewer flex that allows you to see veins in your hand. So this is a picture I took last week in Washington, DC, of someone using this. Um, and this is a picture from their website. It can um, do a very nice job of illuminating this. It's particularly useful for, um, for pediatric settings where it can be hard to find veins. So we'll be using this to support our clinical trial. The other thing is how to transport these cryopreserved parasites. Um, and so people have done cost modeling. They don't think it's going to cost that much. It's going to be vapor phase liquid nitrogen. In some ways, this is easier than um, wet ice. And uh, Steve Hoffman even has pictures of people with backpacks on going around Africa. So some of you are chuckling because you already got to the quote. Um, this seems doable because the veterinary field has already done this in Africa for um, artificial insemination in, in cows. And so Marcel Tanner, who's a parasitologist, said that if you can carry both semen into the deep Saharan belt, why can't you do that for um, a human vaccine? So I couldn't find a picture of the, the backpack approach. But I did find a picture of this guy who works for a sperm bank and has a um, bike <laughs> with uh, liquid nitrogen. So I think if we simply rebrand this, um, we'll be quite successful at moving these things around. An alternative to the PFSPZ vaccine is to not use irradiated parasites, but to use genetically attenuated parasites. And this is a homegrown effort um, that is here in Seattle and um, was pioneered by Stefan Kappa at Seattle Biomed. Stefan's group um, made a genetically attenuated parasite by knocking out two genes. They had a lot of preclinical data to suggest that this was safe and effective. So they undertook a phase one dose escalation study. It was broadly antigenic, so if you looked at the immune responses before and after immunization, these people made responses not just to CSP, but to lots of other antigens, which you would expect. So the low-dose group, no one became parasitemic by virtue of the vaccine alone. But in the high-dose group, one out of six people um, actually broke through and developed a red cell stage infection, despite um, the evidence that this was a severely attenuated parasite. They went back and genotyped the um, person's uh, parasites who was in the breakthrough group, and they found out that this was not a wild-type revertant parasite. This was, in fact, um, the genetically attenuated parasite. And so what, that, um, ha what they've concluded is that this double knockout is a severely but incompletely attenuated parasite. And so Stefan's group is looking at additional gene deletions to increase the attenuation, and it's expected that one of these will go forward in the trial in the coming year. But the question you might be wondering is if this one company already has a vaccine, why should we make genetically attenuated parasites? There's a number of reasons, and this is why Stefan's group is pursuing this. Um, the first are that with a genetic lesion, the parasites arrest at a very specific time point. They're genetically homogeneous, which is good if you want to submit this to the FDA. The antigens, because you can let the parasite um, mature further, um, overlap the blood stages. And the most important reason is that these genetically attenuated parasites seem to induce more protective immunity than you get when you use irradiated parasites. And there's sort of three lines of evidence there. <coughs> One, in mice, you can administer the vaccine subcutaneously or intradermally and still get protection. Two, um, you can 
immunize the mice against the sporozoid and liver stage, and because of this broad antigenicity, you can protect the mouse against a challenge where instead of administering the form from the mosquito, you just bypass that and challenge them with infected red cells. So it's cross-stage protection. And finally, you can challenge the mice with a different species, suggesting that the immunity is quite broad. So it may be that the genetically attenuated parasites are really the way forward, and it's important to remember that all of these techniques that Scenaria has developed will be useful for either approach. We think that the less attenuated parasites basically form broader immune responses, and our lab um, has uh, been working along these lines to um, study the immune repertoire of mice that are immunized with either irradiated, genetically attenuated, or unattenuated parasites. And we basically find more diverse and stronger responses in the mice that get the least attenuated parasites. So the real question is how, if these are making responses against late stage antigens, how do we go about finding those antigens? And um, the approach that our lab and um, two other companies in the US are taking is to use a system that basically is, is called reverse vaccinology. This is a, a figure that I've adapted from um, a group that studies meningococcus, where reverse vaccinology was first pioneered. But the basic premise is to take a pathogen. Now that we have all this genomic data, we can figure out what its genes are. We can select targets. Um, maybe we want to select 100 targets or 1,000 targets to study. We can either make libraries of these targets, and we can shoot those targets directly into an animal and look to see what kind of immune responses. Alternatively, we could challenge the animal with parasites themselves, and we can use the same library to sort of evaluate the immune responses. And so by doing this, we can use not just naturally acquired immunity, but experimentally induced immunity against a broad range of antigens in the hope of being able to winnow the list from 5,200 genes down to a more manageable set that might form a vaccine that has 50 or 100 components. We think that this approach will help to overcome what we, what we see as sort of immune bias that occurs when you give the parasite again and again. So most of these whole sporozoid approaches involve one or two or th at least three or four doses of the parasite. And what we think happens is that we end up biasing our immune responses against antigens that occur, that are present early, and that we really never get to boost the antigens that occur late because the vaccine becomes increasingly effective, not just against challenge, but actually against the vaccine itself. And so our lab and others are trying to understand this question. Basically, we, th we, we think that what we need to do, this is what I think we need to do for these vaccines, is to think about malaria immunology the way we might treat tumors. So if you have a tumor and you open somebody up, you get a scalpel and you get a surgeon and you cut it out. You cut out everything that you can see. And then you do some kind of consolidation therapy to get at the things you can't see. So when we have malaria parasites that we acquire, we think that these early responses to things like CSP, which we've spent a great deal of time studying, end up debulking. They're the scalpel that debulks most of the incoming load. But the problem is we know that 95% isn't good enough. One parasite going through can still cause malaria. And so what our group is trying to do is add late stage antigens um, to this list to basically serve as the consolidation responses to kill off every last parasite. So in closing, um, I would just summarize and say that the RTSS vaccine um, is really likely to significantly have some impact on the burden of malaria, morbidity, and mortality, but it is not um, a vaccine that induces sterile immunity. Whole sporozoid vaccines um, do induce that kind of immunity, and there are some challenges to their manufacture and delivery, but many of these challenges are being met. There may be a vaccine beyond these two vaccines that is the optimal vaccine, and many groups, ours and others, are trying to help develop that. So I think there's really great reason to be hopeful. And it's really nice then to work in Seattle where all of these partners are really committed to malaria eradication. And I just, this is sort of just some closing thoughts. I mean, I think, I hope this effort can really be sustained over many years so that this child in Tanzania doesn't have to go to the clinic for malaria. It's a picture of my friend Carl Seidel in Malawi treating a child who has cerebral malaria so that this doesn't have to happen. And we're really closer than ever to making a malaria vaccine Maybe it's the first one, maybe there will be two or three, or maybe there will be several iterations. Um, but I, I hope this effort here and elsewhere will be sustained. And so as we take some questions, these are just some pictures of hopefully some of the beneficiaries of malaria vaccines and all the other tools that we're employing in the eradication effort. I'll take any questions you have. Thanks.
the question is um, one antigen is called apical merozoite antigen. Um, it's been in some vaccine formulations and had, had, has had varying levels of efficacy. Um, it's still found in some candidates that are moving forward, and the question is why. So I think that whole list that I put up with the five million questions, I mean, a big area of vaccine development is adjuvant development, and IDRI here in Seattle is, is very involved in that. If you put an antigen in with no adjuvant or the wrong adjuvant, you get either no response or an undesirable response. And so um, it's really unclear what the set of hurdles you should put an antigen through before discarding it. And the WHO um, just last week said that they plan in 2014 to come out with a list of guidelines that will help people decide on when to discard an antigen. I think the consensus is that for things like that, um, we, we don't really know whether we should discard them yet, and so they've been reformulated um, into these multi-antigen cocktails to see if maybe we can still derive some benefit. Dr. Winter. Yeah, Sean, beautiful talk. Um, what's known about the different species of malaria? Will they each require a different set of these approaches, or is there, are there antigens in common? So the question was, um, will there be one malaria vaccine, or will there be a malaria vaccine for every species? Um, there are five species of malaria, and Plasmodium vivax and falciparum are the principal two that we talk about. In rodent studies, you can get cross-species protection um, between Plasmodium burgii and Uellii, Plasmodium um, Uellii and Vincii, and these are at varying evolutionary distances from each other. Um, so it's not clear sort of whether Plasmodium falciparum vaccine will protect against vivax. In the whole history of human challenges, there has been only one person who's been vaccinated with sporozoites against P. falciparum and went on to a vivax challenge. You'll recall vivax requires reticulocytes, so it's hard to culture. Um, and so with an N of one, there's one person who was not protected. But this is very much um, what scenario and lots of other people want to ask um, once there's one good vaccine in the field. So it's possible, it's hopeful. And maybe what we have to do is um, supplement one vaccine with some added antigens that aren't conferred by a sporozoid, but some exogenous way to sort of fill the gaps, if you will. Sean, I was really interested in, in the approach of packaging the malaria uh, antigen together with hepatitis B surface antigen, and you showed the relative antibody responses where the FB SAG response was quite durable over time despite the fact that your anti-malaria response went down. So is that, is that a function of the, the biological response to those? What, what determines how long an antibody like that stays around? Um, the question was, why is there discordance between the antibody um, response duration for hep B surface antigen and the CSP um, antigen? So I don't know all the particulars of that. It's known that like when someone who lives in an endemic setting leaves the endemic setting, they often um, have sharp um, decrement in their antibody responses to malaria antigens. Um, you know, the parasite is, a, and so a lot of people think that means that you need to maintain exposure, right? You're getting boosters, and that's probably going to be a feature of this, of a successful vaccine in order to maintain that. Um, the parasite has really co-evolved with people for a long time, and it's a eukaryotic parasite, and despite 200 million people being infected, only 1 million die. It's a very low case fatality rate, and it's eukaryotic, so it shares a lot of homology with us. So I think when our immune system sees it and it sees hep B surface antigen, I mean, the, the degree of foreignness is much less for the malaria parasite. And what we need to do is find the responses that will, could be sustained but are not so vigorous that it would kill the host, right? So we have to kind of find that balance. I don't have a great answer, but it's a pretty good parasite. Just a, a similar question from that one. With the vaccine, with the hepatitis B surface antigen, did you find a higher percent of people responded to produce anti-hepatitis B surface antibody? So I don't know all of the RTSS data on that. I know that um, some of the subjects, um, many of the subjects have pre-existing hep B um, responses. And so it's a little bit hard to evaluate the data and mass like that. Um, so you would see in that one group, in the control group, right, which, they, which are getting rabies and meningococcus vaccines, they're also, they have anti-hep B surface antibodies. Um, and that's just because that's part of the EPI program. Has anybody done any studies on the irradiated 
you know, they said the irradiated form then is attenuated and looked at the genetic effect that occurs after radiation to see where, where they matter? So that's a very good question. Um, there's been a lot of, oh, the question is, has anybody looked at the um, expression and genomic changes, let's say, in the irradiated parasites? We have um, a lot of data on expression of uh, genes and parasites in animal models, so we can look at the gene expression in sporozoites and the liver stage, et cetera. Most of those have been done using wild-type parasites um, and then looked at different time points. I think that data set is one that might be coming, um, and it would be very interesting to, to know or to do, for instance, the proteome um, induced by those parasites. And so we have some efforts along those lines to try to look at um, to have sort of discovery approaches to what's going on there. Um, but even if you shoot in 10,000 liver, 10,000 sporozoites into this, the liver, it's a very small number of infected cells compared to the whole liver. So we're still like needle in a haystack when we talk about those kind of discovery tools. All right. Thank you very much.